This is the day that the Lord has made, and we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Bright, I invite you to celebrate God and all that God is doing at Bright on this day. Well, it's a beautiful, beautiful season to celebrate Jesus and the life of Jesus. So I now invite you to join me in prayer. God, thank you so much for keeping us and allowing us to be in your presence on this Tuesday morning. God, we might not be together, but separately, we still worship you. And God, we enjoy the community that we are in virtually. God, thank you for all of the ways that you provide for us and all of the ways that you continue to nurture us and love us. God, it's been a rough season. It's been a rough year. But we are so, so grateful for all of the ways that you've shown up and that you've been with us and the ways that you've cared for us in ways that we could never care for and love ourselves. So God, thank you for being the God who was, the God who is, and the God who will be. Thank you for being majestic in the way that you work Thank you for leading us and God guiding us and covering us each and every single day in ways that we don't even realize. God, as this year of 2020 comes to an end, God, we're looking forward to the next year and all of the ways that you will continue to be present. We're looking forward with hopefulness and we're looking forward with joy, knowing that we are going to see some better things on the other side. That in the new year, God, we look with expectation for healing for this nation. We look for expectation of your kingdom manifesting itself on this earth. So God, as we dwell on the life of Jesus on this morning. God, we're grateful for the sacrifice. We're grateful for his life and his work and his ministry. God, through Jesus, we learn so much about being compassionate. We learn about love and justice. So God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all of the ways that you've shown us how to live and how to love and how to be through Jesus's life. We're grateful. It is in your name that we pray, amen. Good morning to every one of you all, both Bright community, friends of Bright family of Bright, or just dropping in. We thank you for joining us for our Bright Christmas worship this morning. And if you are new, by all means, drop a little line. And if you're not new, still drop us a line. Um, you could have chosen any place to be this uh, Tuesday morning and 
we are thankful that you chose to be with us. So let us celebrate into the season that is Advent. Let us celebrate into the season of preparation for a coming of newness. And also let us celebrate another musician here within the Bright community that will be joining us today. So our musician extraordinaire is Jonathan Greer, who is a first year MDiv student, a gifted vocalist who has performed in many different vocal ensembles and has also provided their services for many different churches. So without further ado, I present to you, Jonathan Greer. Please hear this reading from the Psalms. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Go away from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your promise that I may live and let me not be put to shame in my hope. This is one of our ancient texts. Thanks be to God. I am so happy to introduce Reverend Kristen Glover, who is a second year MDiv student who comes from the United Methodist tradition. She is currently serving as the youth minister at First United Methodist Church out in Paris, Texas, where she served for the last seven years. These days, Kristen finds the most joy in playing hide and seek with her two-year-old Adeline and husband and husband. So we thank God for Kristen and the word she will give today. Good morning, Bright family. Thank you, Zane, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm realizing we probably should have talked ahead of time about names. So I have two complicated names in my family. One is my daughter's name, which is Adeline, and the other one, which is my husband's name, which is Rube, which many people uh, stumble on both of those. So thank you, um, and sorry for not uh, gifting you with those names ahead of time. This morning, before I begin, I must confess to you all that this message has not come easily for me. When I first received the invitation to be with you, my immediate response was yes. You see, my cup had just been filled up from Sunday's worship of kicking off the season of Advent, and I thought, surely I can give a word about hope to my fellow bright students, faculty, and staff. Then it set in. I realized I would be speaking to my fellow bright students, faculty, and staff. A group of academics and scholars far smarter and more well-read than I. What word about hope could I possibly give to them, especially considering the year we have all shared together? When I began my search for a text today, I thought, well, surely I can go to my liturgical texts uh, because after all, I'm a good Methodist and the lectionary will guide me towards a word of hope. If you have read the Isaiah, 1 Thessalonians or Luke readings for today out of your lectionary, you may have found, like Dr. Gaffney says, I would have needed to do some wrestling with these texts to bring about a good word. Based on these texts, I felt that was an impossible task to do considering today is supposed to be a short homily. So I did what any good 21st century student would do while looking for a text in this situation and Googled scriptures about hope. 
Again, let me remind you, you are a group of academics and scholars far smarter and more well-read than I. I have had to use what tools were available to me in my tool belt. This is when I discovered our text for today. Let me read it for you again. Psalm 119, 113, and 116. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Go away from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your promise that I may live and let me not be put to shame in my hope. When reflecting on this text, a small section from the longest Psalm, as it has 176 lines and verses, I thought a lot about this past year. This long Psalm is a wrestling with God. Although this particular Psalm is written as a praise of God's Torah, it has highs and lows, ebbs and flows as the writer voices their faith and commitment to God, but still struggles with the oppression and injustice they see and experience in their world. Now I must name, I personally, as a white privileged cis woman who grew up in the United States, have not known much oppression or injustice personally. Although growing up in the South, I have been witness to much of the oppression and injustice which surrounds me. My first exposure to some of these injustices was when I was just in the fifth grade, delivering turkeys and supplies for a Thanksgiving meal to families who lacked the financial resources to have such a meal. I ran into one of my classmates from school on one of my deliveries and I had no idea up until that point that we lived such two very different lives. This is one of the many instances when I began to realize where you are born, to whom you are born, what color you are born matters greatly. This classmate and I shared many things in common, like our identified gender, attending the same school, having the same teachers and growing up in the same town. But our skin colors and socioeconomic class separated our experiences like a vast ocean. This type of systematic racism is one form of injustice I hope 2020 is beginning to chip away at. But honestly, much like the writer of the Psalm, I struggle to believe that is true. I struggle to believe in the promise God gave us through Abraham and Sarah. Earlier in Psalm 119, the psalmist tells God in verse 38, confirm to your servant your promise, which is for those who fear you. Later on in verse 41, the psalmist says, let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. I hear the psalmist also requesting a word of hope, a reminder from the divine that what Abraham and Sarah were promised is still true in the psalmist's time. I find myself in a similar place today, also asking for a word of hope from God, clinging to the word I was taught growing up, the words of Mary and the promise conceived within her. In Luke, Mary praises God after discovering she is pregnant with Emmanuel. She gives thanks to God for showing strength by scattering the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, for bringing down the powerful from their thrones and lifting up the lowly, for filling the hungry with good things and sending them away, the rich away empty. All of this being done according to the promise God made with Mary's ancestors to Abraham and Sarah and to their descendants. In a world of double-minded people who seem to have lost the sight of what God is about, I hope in your word, God, 
as the psalmist hopes. I hope that Mary's words will come to pass. I hope evildoers will go away as the psalm says, for according to your promise, you will uphold your servants so we may live into your promise. And that by hoping we will not be put to shame. I would like to leave you with some words from the group now known as the Chicks. The song is entitled, I Hope, and is from their album, Taking the Long Way, which was released in 2006. Sunday morning, I heard the preacher say, thou shall not kill. I don't wanna hear nothing else about killing and it's God's will. Because our children are watching us. They put their trust in us. They're going to be like us. So let's learn from our history and do it differently. I hope for more love, for joy and laughter. I hope you have more than you'll ever need. I hope you'll have more happy ever afters. I hope you can live more fearlessly and you can lose all the pain and misery. I hope, I hope. Brought my tree down to the shore, the garland and the silver star, to find my peace and grieve no more, to heal this place inside my heart. On every branch I laid some bread And hungry birds filled out the sky They rang like bells around my head They sang my spirit back to life one tiny child can change the world. One shining light can show the way. For all my tears, for what I've lost, there's still my joy. There's still my joy for Christmas Day. comes down on empty sand. There's tints of moonlight on the waves. My soul was lost, but here I am. So this must be amazing grace. One tiny child can change the one shining light can show the way beyond these tears for what I've lost. There's still my joy, there's still my joy on Christmas Day. Still, my joy for Christmas Day.
Please hear these words from Matthew. An account of the genealogy of Jesus and the, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Aram, and Aram, the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph, Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat. 
and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers, at the time of, of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abud, and Abud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathen, and Mathen the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband to Ma of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation uh, to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Please forgive all those um, butchered names, but this is one of our ancient texts. Thanks be to God. I am happy to introduce to you John Kurtz, Reverend John Kurtz, who is in his first semester here at Bright in the MATM program and on track for social transformation. John's undergrad study of religion and Spanish at Wabash College influenced his ministerial interests in social justice and sharing knowledge, centering around the interplay of language and texts with the world. When he is not reading, John is likely to be found exploring nature with friends, running, or bottling kombucha. Please welcome John and the word he will give us today. Thank you so much for that introduction, Zane. And um, I apologize for the long list of names as well. You did it amazing. Um, lately, I've been thinking about what Christmas will look like this year around my family in rural Indiana. And I love my very large family, but this year more than usual, I feel anxious. Um, I feel anxious for how social and familial strife will emerge about the present and its issues and about the past and its traumas. Um, with this as the background, I've been reflecting on the meaning of Christ in this Advent season. And today I wanna to focus on the genealogy in the first verses of Matthew's telling of the gospel. I hear in this genealogy a way of understanding Christ that acknowledges and preserves the messiness of the past and offers a hopeful view of the future. And for me, a hopeful view of family too. I want to suggest reading this as foreshadowing the unexpected and, and the expectation reversing nature of Jesus's ministry. I hear Matthew's genealogy of Jesus to say that the Messiah may be different than what the author's audience was expecting and may be different than what we can expect. I normally struggle when I encounter lists of names to imagine the significance. What is this genealogy doing here? Um, what does it say for today? Looking closely at these names though, I realize that something seems strange. Um, Jesus's lineage in Matthew includes Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, um, Bathsheba, who is hidden behind the title of Uriah's wife. These characters and many others disrupt any imagination of a perfect family tree. There are many more details and issues than, that come up than I can address here. Still, I stumble on the narrative in Genesis of Tamar, who is the daughter-in-law of Judah. Um, their children are the ancestors to Jesus. I struggle with the surrogacy in Ruth and wonder if Naomi exploits that arrangement. Um, the text seems to indicate it. The difficult stories continue as the genealogy calls them to mind. Um, each one of those names has a person behind it whose life has 
trauma and joy and the things that make us human. Um, but the themes of brokenness and trauma unite these names in this genealogy as much as their roots lead towards Jesus in the narrative. Um, and so I kind of ask, in what way is this good news? An idealized understanding of Christ that is elevated beyond us at the right hand of God is hard to reconcile with what this genealogy tells us. Aware of my own emotional response to the past and this scripture and what it brings for me to wrestle with, I wonder if the tension in the text anticipates a reimagination of Christ for the first century followers of Jesus and for today. This lineage does not have me expect a Messiah who is king and rules over chosen people, but a Jesus whose lineage is fractured and imperfect, and a Christ who is human, who is in our broken families too. I hear this to say that brokenness is not imperfection or incompletion either, that fractures are part of the story and we are whole in it with Christ. From this perspective, the Messiah is not set up in Matthew to reign on earth, and the lineage is not idealized beyond human experience. Maybe this anticipates the reversal of expectations throughout Jesus's ministry. I hear unexpected references in the genealogy as analogous to the reversal of the social and familial norms, both in Jesus's day and today. And if we take seriously this as good news, then I hear the good news to be that Jesus, I hear that that Christ is there in the middle of the messiness. But I'm also reminded whom Jesus calls his family in the scripture. We are reminded of this past, but we are not limited to it. Our family is our neighbors, those around us. I hear in this genealogy an invitation to imagine a Christ that is hopeful because of the fractured past and living into the diversity around us. Um, I will carry this hope in the family I find around, in those around me here in Texas, rather far from home, um, because I have been needing to lately, especially, uh, but also hope that this way of viewing this genealogy helps me to see beyond the anxiety that these coming weeks of Christmas may bring, um, and maybe for many of us, it does bring anxiety to be around the family. Um, I pray that we can all remember the past so we trust in the unexpected and find hope in this season as well. Thank you. We invite you to um, go ahead and gather your communion elements, um, the juice or wine, as well as the cracker or bread that we will be partaking in shortly. And this season, it's such a beautiful time to remember Jesus in Jesus's life. Jesus was instrumental in shaking the very core of this earth through his ministry, we are able to truly see that sacrifice translates into movements. Sacrifice translates into kingdom building on this earth. Jesus's life was not long. He was about 33 when he gave up his life. And in those 33 years, he was able to do such phenomenal work 
that here today on Tuesday, December 1st, 2020, we still celebrate him and all that he was and all of the ways that he loved and all of the ways that he showed us that there is always another way, that there is another paradigm that we can exist in, in which that um, justice prevails and that racism does not, that sexism does not, that hatred does not. And so in this season, I'm so grateful for Jesus and Jesus's life. It's a Christmas here at Bright. And in this Christmas season, we're called to remember everything that Jesus was and all of the ways that he still ministers to each of us. So on the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he sat down with his disciples and he was mentoring them and ministering to them. And he told them, he said, tonight I invite you to take a cracker or take this bread, allow it to represent my life and my body and my work that I have done on this earth. Every time you partake in it, Remember me. Likewise, Jesus took the cup that was filled with wine and he said, this is my blood that is shed for you through everything that I've done and all of the ways that I've shown you how to love and how to be and, and how to honor God. I invite you to every time that you partake in this cup to remember me and to remember my ministry. God, thank you for the life of Jesus. Thank you for all of the ways that he shows us another path. Thank you for all of the ways that he shows us that there is always another possibility, that we can always flip the script, that we can always do something new. Thank you so much for love, for sacrifice, for dedication, for passion. Amen. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are When the song 
of the angels is still when the star in the sky is gone when the kings and princes are shepherds are back with their flock. The work of Christmas Well, I'm so overjoyed with the beautiful worship experience that we shared on this morning. I'm so, so grateful for the giftedness of our worship leaders, Jonathan Greer and Deshay uh, Jackson. I'm so grateful for the ways that they have ministered to us today. And who knew that Jonathan had such a voice? I'm also grateful for our preachers this morning, Kristen Glover and John Kurtz who accepted the invitation without hesitation and honored God on this morning by preaching messages of hope and of newness and uh, looking ahead to what's to come with joy and anticipation. I'm grateful for all of the gifts that we have at Bright and all the ways that we are able to connect as a community and worship together and be together. So thank you for joining us on this morning. We hope that you'll stick around after worship and uh, just connect with us and be together for a few moments after worship. So if you'd like to join us, just remain on after worship concludes and we'll be joining together. This is our last worship experience for the year 2020. So as you go through the rest of your year, be reminded of all of the beauty that's around us. In this difficult time, it can be so easy to feel hopeless and to feel grief and despair. But we have a God who transcends COVID. We have a God that transcends hatred and all of the, all of the injustices that we've seen play out this year. And so the God who walks with us will carry us through to 2021. And that God will show us that we can do a new thing on this earth. So I'm excited this morning because I know that newness is coming, that there will be another season for us on the other side. So while we won't be together again this year, I'm so grateful that we've been able to share in these last few months and to be together and worship together. So thank you. As always, thank you to the Bright Worship Planning Team and all of the work that you do every single day to make worship happen. Remember that today is Giving Tuesday. I invite you to support Bright Divinity School financially. Um, also, please remember that this week we'll be having coffee hour, our last coffee hour of 2020 as well. It's been a beautiful journey. I'm grateful for the companionship of each of you as we journey together. Now, as we look forward, God, thank you. Thank you for hope. Thank you for promise. Thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. <laughs>